It is now time for me to introduce a person that, um, a person I sometimes think is easier to talk about in terms of what she doesn't do rather than what she does do. She's a neuroscientist, an entrepreneur, an author, a TED Talk star, one of America's most celebrated speakers on artificial intelligence, also a co-founder of SoCo Labs, an independent think tank uh, that explores the future of human potential. Uh, you may be wondering exactly what that is. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Vivian Ming to tell you exactly what it is. Thank you so much for welcome, Vivian. Oh, I like to wander around, so I had the mic me up uh, so I didn't have to stand behind a podium. Uh, it's a reasonable question. It sounds like a pretty much just a bullshit phrase, the future of human potential. Um, I have the coolest job in the world. I am a professional mad scientist. Uh, so I get to just take problems. Uh, some of them walk in the door. Uh, Dr. Ming, my daughter has 500 seizures a day. Please save her life. Uh, some of them we incubate internally, and I'm actually going to talk about a few of those tonight. And others uh, are on a totally different scale. Uh, I got to hang out with the uh, Office of the Secretary General of the UN and talk about global AI policy, which I think we've got totally wrong. But I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Um, what I want to talk about, given the context of this event, is the idea of doing good in the world. Um, we can set aside the business side for just a moment, uh, not because it doesn't matter. Someone's got to pay for this stuff eventually. Uh, but I really want to take, talk about what it takes to use business, to use technology, to use the privilege and opportunity that we have to do some genuine good in the world. And I'm going to do that because I'm very selfish and self-absorbed by talking about some of my own work. Uh, because that's who I am. So I started my life as a theoretical neuroscientist. Uh, if you don't know what a theoretical neuroscientist is, just substitute the word lazy for theoretical, and you probably have a pretty good idea. So we use machine learning to study the brain, uh, and then we study the brain to come up with better machine learning. So if any of you are familiar with what modern AI is, which is this thing called deep learning or deep neural networks, that pretty much came right out of our field. So you later can thank me or pillory me. I'm not certain what the appropriate response is. Um, but I was there for the last 20 years in the emergence of this phenomenon. The first project I ever worked on was actually as an undergraduate researcher doing real-time lie detection off of raw video for the CIA, uh, which it's a little morally gray, um, but it was cool as hell. I thought I was going to stick wires in cat brains for the rest of my career. And instead, I was able to build this thing. And it could learn on its own to tell if someone was happy or not, or whether they were lying. Uh, we actually got to build that into a pair of Google Glass. So you know, I could imagine looking around this room and yes, maybe tell whether or not this is a Duchesne smile or not a Duchesne smile? I'm sure that's what you want to know. That's what happens when your eye, your orbital muscles crinkle up. That's a Duchesne smile. It's a real smile. Um, and we can, uh, sorry, I'm making this hard for the cameraman. Um, so we can, we can actually see that. And this thing can learn something that used to be a purely human judgment. Uh, an interesting uh, addition to this story is we got to take that technology, and when I say we, sort of this is a woman thing, I mean me. Um, uh, we got to take this technology um, and uh, yeah, we got to build that Google Glass and I could look around the room and uh, maybe I could float your credit scores over your heads. Uh, perhaps I could um, pull up your LinkedIn account uh, or your Facebook account, or your Grindr account, or if you're a CFO, your Ashley Madison account. Um, I'm always very disturbed by how many people get that joke. Um, so uh, all of which I think would be awful. We built this for autistic children, so that in real interactions with other people, they could learn how to read facial expressions, something that unlike for the rest of us, they don't get for free. Uh, and in fact, it turned out not only can they learn to read facial expressions even better 
than the gold standard today, which is a cartoon face on a flashcard. But they learn empathy, because the cartoon face doesn't have a reason why it's happy or sad. But an actual person in the moment does. And what's missing is being able to connect that story together. We were able to take the same technology and we built, for my very first tech startup, uh, I don't remember, 12 years ago or something, uh, like any good Silicon Valley entrepreneur, um, I took this amazing technology and we built an incredibly sleazy game called Sexy Face. Uh, and you came to the game and you picked out the faces that you thought are sexy. And our promise was that for free, we find everyone on Facebook who you think is sexy, and for $5, we'll find everyone who thinks you're sexy. Um, now, before you think I'm a truly awful person, actually, it's probably a fair assumption anyways, but not for this. Turns out that's a Trojan. As soon as you played the game a couple of times, it then confessed, actually, it's just a mind-reading game. Come up with any face category, and we'll figure it out. Uh, in fact, the freaky thing is it really worked. I mean, it would figure out who you thought was sexy, I guess, unless you have a foot thing. Um, <laughs> at one point, I joked, you know, we'd, we'd have built that too, but, you know, we couldn't find a database of good foot images to train it on. <laughs> it turns out I am horrifically wrong about that. Um, so, uh, so you play the game. Oh, I don't know. It's... Um, uh, Southeast Asian, uh, male, mutton chops with a sense of ennui. And it turns out, even though maybe you could not articulate what it was that made a face look like it had ennui, this could learn it, as long as you were consistent in how you made the judgments. Why did I do any of this and build this game? I will freely admit, it crossed my mind to actually release the real game. Um, we did it for, in fact, one of the um, UN Millennial Goals for a program called Refugees United. Uh, so we built this system and people played this sleazy game and then the mind reading game and our AI learned not just about faces but how people perceive faces. Like perhaps the face of your niece. You haven't heard from your sister's family um, in months and you're fearing the, the worst because it's war, and you go to a refugee center, um, and they give you a book, and it has a million photographs in it. Literally, 10 years ago, that's how many photos were in these books. A million photographs of orphan refugees lost in camps. And you start leafing through this, and I hope on day three you don't blink as she goes by. We were able to build this thing, and then put it on a tablet, and you play something kind of like the game. Here's a bunch of faces out of the book. Pick the one that looks most like your niece. And what we found is after three or so screens, give it five minutes, if she's in any camp anywhere in the world, you found her. Now, oh, thank you. Uh, AI is a scary thing, and uh, maybe if I have time, I'm uh, sort of counting down. It's like the end is near already. Um, I, I, I want to do justice to that as well. But I think when we talk about sustainable business, when we talk about doing good in business, what I want to be clear is I love the kind of technology that I build. And I believe in the power of markets uh, to be a force uh, better than most others, for making decisions. But they don't magically do good. They do good because we choose to do good with them. You can take these amazing technologies and do horrific things. And that's happening. And you can take markets and abuse them and make every effort to get every dollar out of it you can. But we have a choice a choice to do something substantial with our work. So I said I'm a professional mad scientist. I started a bunch of companies. I, that first one was supposed to be an education company, but it turned out VCs didn't think that this made me a good, in, that, was, that made me risky. Um, so uh, we shifted and then sold the company and then founded a bunch of others. Then I got to be the chief scientist at a few others. And, you know, it was wonderful, and I, and I loved everything we did. It always had a lot more heart than business sense. Uh, but every step of the way, we did better and better, and uh, I got to build things that I really believed in. 
And then I reached a point in my life where I got to do whatever I wanted. And so we founded uh, Socos Labs, and it's very simple. We get those phone calls. Uh, Dr. Ming, can you save my daughter's life? One from just four weeks ago. Dr. Ming, my son can't enter REM sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep, where the memories that you are forming during the day begin to get consolidated into your brain. Well, gosh, if you can't enter REM sleep, I'm it's horrific to say this, but it's been studied, uh, typically during wartime. If we wake you up every time you're about to enter REM sleep, you die. You die pretty quickly, stress-related heart failure. But this kid's still alive. Two years later, totally disabled, can't do anything. Now, I'm not a neuroendocrinologist. Uh, I don't study sleep. But everybody's tried to make a difference. And then they came to me. And I will do what I do for all of the projects we work on. I will take my team, and we will educate our dumb asses about a problem, because the last thing you ever want to get the trap in is thinking you're the smartest person, and you already know what to do. And then we will try something, something crazy, mad science. They've tried all the other stuff. So now it's time to do something completely different, something no VC would fund, something no uh, science initiative would grant to. But try something and pay for it all. And whatever we invent, we give away at the other end. So oh, please, I appreciate that, but my ego is big enough already. Um, <laughs> so let me give uh, three examples of projects we're currently working on. And I'm going to start with one that sounds like it might connect with some of the discussions earlier today. Uh, right now, in, certainly in Silicon Valley, but I think we've probably all spent enough time at Milken conferences and other events where you get that the panels tend to be a lot of straight white guys. And, um, uh, you know, after a little while, that gets a little tedious. Um, not because straight white guys are awful people. I used to be one of you. Uh, you're good. Um, <laughs> but, um, but rather because there is so much more potential in the world than this tiny sliver of uh, people that had the privilege to be who they were. Um, there is so much that people could bring to this world. But sometimes we don't measure it. And as people often say, if you don't measure it, we don't track it, we don't make it. So what if we could come up with an economic index that actually measured the real world impact of all of these non-traditional entrepreneurs, everyone that's different? So I'm starting in the US with the 50 biggest metro regions. And we built a system using a lot of fancy machine learning. Uh, it'll be released uh, with some fanfare this September that tracks in real time job creation, IP creation, uh, economic activity, and more generated by LGBT entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs. And then what we really are wanting to do to uh, make a big shift is expand into Europe, Africa, and Southeast Asia, and include refugee entrepreneurs in our metric. If we could understand not just that jobs, my nephew's job was created by someone that looks very different from me, um, that maybe loves someone different than the way I love someone, but you understand your life is better just because they existed, just because they were willing to create something that would benefit everyone around them. If you can measure that, and then not make it a shaming exercise. I don't know how many Americans here, but you can probably guess which cities are going to look bad and which cities are going to look good on such an index. Um, but this is where some of the fancy AI comes in. What we pair it with is a projection, a prediction, a counterfactual in the world of economists of what it could be. And then we look at the policies that we believe would causally lead from where it is today to what it could be in every one of those 50 cities. We want to give policymakers the chance to say, wouldn't you want more jobs in your city? And your own sons and daughters or your new neighbors want to create those jobs. And here are the simple things you could do to make it happen. A lot of fancy machine learning goes into making this. A lot of data mining and partnerships with other organizations. We build it all, 
We're going to just make it available to anyone who wants to take a look at this. Uh, and I would really love to expand this out beyond the United States because entrepreneurship isn't just about San Francisco. It's about people building something. And if you could show them that they could build it and make a choice to make the world a better place, uh, then we keep the promise of a room like this, which is the business not only can be sustainable, but business can be something that actually grows the world for everyone. Um, so let me talk about brains. Uh, I will freely admit that the reason I went to uh, grad school was to build cyborgs. Uh, so not so much the Borg for any Star Trek fans in the room. Um, that's not really, I'm not sort of a Terminator sort of person. Um, but take this for example. We know with excruciating molecular detail how things like childhood household stress permanently reduces working memory span. The amount of stuff you can pay attention to and remember at any given time. That may not sound like a huge issue to you, but working memory span is a huge predictor of how much money people will make in their lifetimes, how long they'll live, uh, how far they'll go in their education. And we take that away from millions and millions of kids around the world. Kids with loving parents that had no intention of doing this, but it happened anyways. What if we could develop a technology, not something expensive that only someone like me could give their children, a technology that could be as available as a vaccine, and we could go to children, say children with traumatic brain injury, that have had their working memory and essentially their future is taken away from them, or maybe children in, that have grown up, some of those orphan refugees, that had all of their original potential robbed from them. And uh, I'm going to give two examples. Uh, one project we're working on is a simple little patch you throw up there. It has a built-in battery. The minute you put it on, it turns on. Uh, the battery runs for about 30 seconds. It does something called uh, alternating current transcranial stimulation. Uh, you really need to know this. Of the midline theta, it's important. There'll be a quiz later. Um, and anyone here uh, old enough to know the old Simon game where there'd be these lights and, and sounds would flash? Uh, if you're not old enough to remember that, fuck you. Um, <laughs> how dare you be younger and more healthy and more pretty than me? Um, so, uh, so this in psychology, we call this the Cosi experiment. And a room like this might be a little bit above average, but if we ran it on everyone, most of us would remember about five, six, seven blank sequences before it becomes too hard to remember what the next one is. You slap this thing on, and almost instantaneously, you can do seven, eight, nine blank sequences. A 20% increase in working memory. You literally are smarter, and there's a little afterglow for about 90 minutes. So for two hours, <laughs> you're, you're actually smarter. Uh, what is a 20% increase in working memory span? Uh, say, when you look at the econometrics of it, uh, that's about $30,000 a year of increased earnings in the United States. That's a huge impact. You're substantially more likely to live uh, a longer time. Turns out people with larger working memory spans have better eating habits uh, for various reasons. You go further in your education. If we could take this, and what the, we're specifically looking at are kids with traumatic brain injury, uh, we can take this and we use it as scaffolding. Not just the thing itself, but you throw this on, and while they're wearing it, while they're back to themselves, then you go in and intensively work on them with a literacy intervention. And while they're a little bit smarter, they gain and they gain and they gain. And if you do that while they're still young, you can change this person and literally transform their brain. You can put the pen back in their hand to write their own life story, something that was entirely destroyed. And that's amazing. On the other end of life, we have Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And in the case of Alzheimer's, one of the most exciting things I've seen recently is uh, a similar concept. Turns out there's all this fancy stuff going on with brain synchrony. Well, um, what if I took a big screen like this over here, and I just did what's called a full screen flicker, really fast, about 30 times per second. That thing just did, and then we paired it with a sound. Well, if you were suffering from Alzheimer's, 
and I sat you in front of that screen for an hour, let's say, a day. Well, if this is Abu Ghraib, you've just broken the Geneva Convention um, uh, because it's really unpleasant. But if you're suffering from Alzheimer's, it turns out it decreases the symptomology. It entrains people's brain activities to, now there's another one, and it will also be on the quiz, to the gamma oscillation range, 30 hertz to more. And it turns out the plaques associated with Alzheimer's decrease, and people's performance on cognitive tasks increases. We have the chance to change what it means to get old, to give people back not just the lives they were born with, but a life they've led their entire uh, time on Earth, uh, that chance to be independent, to be you for that much longer. Uh, and again, uh, we're doing this jointly with uh, some startups, so I don't get to make their products available for free, but we get to take these things and work with these kids and work with these Alzheimer's patients and just treat them at no cost and deliver everything we discovered uh, out into the world because the world's a better place for having done that. Uh, and the last thing, as I'm almost out of time, uh, is gaze tracking. Uh, one last bit of fancy smancy technology uh, that's actually been around for a little bit. Uh, you pull out your phone. Oh, I should have said this. Anyone here have an iPhone, iPhone 10? Yeah. Um, that was uh, $50 million worth of CIA funding. So that's my undergraduate lab. We built all the face recognition technology, all funded by the CIA, that now animates cats on your phone. So um, <laughs> this is the one absolute truth of innovation is no matter what it is, in the end, all it does is animate cats. Um, <laughs> quantum computing, blockchain, it'll be cats in the end, trust me. Uh, I guess in the quantum computing case, you won't know whether they're alive or dead, but you know. Um, so, um, so we're able to build this technology where we could track what you're looking at on the screen. And it turns out there's all sorts of fascinating things you can do with that. Um, what's important is we can do it entirely on device, edge as it's called. So we don't have to transmit anything back to anybody. Your gaze behavior doesn't go back to Google or Baidu or Amazon or anyone else. Everything is right there. Why? Because the things we're building are a system for tracking the progressions of Parkinson's. We are building a system, hopefully uh, uh, jointly with uh, Sesame Workshop, to track how kids watch the videos, not to do something nefarious with it, but so that we can create something for their parents to come back in and talk to them about. Uh, hey, you know, your kid was really interested in the relationship between Bert and Ernie. There might be a conversation there. Um, uh, but whatever it might be, you know, uh, it, we can work that. In fact, we're even able to use it. We had a discussion earlier at the table uh, that one of the biggest predictors of long-term positive life outcomes is purpose. Or as a scientist would call it, construct strength of purpose. It doesn't matter what that purpose is. What matters is it's bigger than you that uh, it takes more than a lifetime to complete. The way I always like to describe it is the world gets better when old men plant trees. They will never rest under its shade. For them, it's all sacrifice and no gain. And yet, the world gets better. And this is, turns out to be the paradox of purpose. We study it in individuals. Uh, interesting enough, we even get to use the eye tracking stuff. We can leverage that for modeling people's personal and social characteristics. Um, but we look at individuals, and we find the people that have the strongest sense of purpose, and the way we measure that is through sacrifice. We look at people that make sacrifices for which they would never recoup a direct benefit. And the fascinating thing, the paradox, is that they live longer. They earn more money. They go further in their education if we look at them younger in life. And rare, although not unique for these sorts of things, they're happier. They have more friends. And then we look at teams within companies, and we find teams that are defined by sacrifice actually have higher productivity. We did this massive project with Accenture, and we found the single biggest untracked source of productivity is what's called collaborative uh, leadership, going out and making everyone around you better, even though you didn't directly benefit from it yourself. 
right? We'll use a lot of fancy machine learning to track people in real time, do all sorts of HR no-nos, um, but it was mad science experiment. Um, and now we look at companies. And what we're beginning to show is the same paradox. The companies that make sacrifices actually have the best outcomes. And sometimes it gets really easy to slide into this sense of all I really need to do is make people think we're a good company. But what I'm saying, Hugh, I'm a hard number scientist, is you have to make a sacrifice. You have to believe this. You have to be able to walk away from the deal that could transform your company because you knew it was wrong. And right now, the world is having a hard time with purpose. Politically, uh, I think there's some challenges in the business world. For 30 years, we've been promising people that globalization would make this amazing change in their life. And now we're promising them what sounds virtually the same thing. Don't worry, don't worry. AI will make amazing and positive changes in your life. Both of them could if we choose for them to do so. If we choose to share the gains rather than concentrate them. And that's a choice, and it's a choice that comes with sacrifice. And I am, this is essentially saying, shut the hell up. <laughs> so let me finish with this. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, so I, uh, I have this opportunity to go out and do this incredibly cool work um, just because I choose to. And a lot of people come up to me, particularly university students, who say, Dr. Ming, I want to be able to do what you do when I get rich. You know, after I've had my successes. And all I can say is, I didn't do that. My first company tanked because we did the UN project, even though it didn't bring in any money. And it was 100% the right thing to do. Uh, I started doing this stuff when I didn't know how to program. It wasn't because I have some special skill. I did it because it's right, because people are alive at the other end. I got to build the first AI to treat diabetes and then give it away. No patent, nothing. Just because we knew more people would be alive because it existed in the world. And I did it because I truly believe my life is better as a result. So I have this one request for you. It is a very motivated room, so I'm not actually going to say something that's terribly shocking. But don't wait. If you're one of the teams uh, that's here in competition, don't wait for the VC to say that you've got a good idea. Don't wait for your board to give you the approval. Go do something amazing tonight. After the party's done, literally don't wait. Get drunk, and as soon as you're sober enough again, <laughs> go out and make a sacrifice. Change the world. Do something amazing, because I promise it will flow back to you. All you have to do is tonight go out and plant a tree. Thank you very much. Thank you.